So namaste and welcome. So um, <clears throat> welcome to anyone that's joining us for the first time as well, especially. Um, I wanted to speak uh, briefly today about something that's come up several times this week. And um, it was something significant for me in my own awakening as well that significantly seemed to slow it down. And it's worth uh, just bringing it to our attention and it's one of these areas of our awakening where there's a lot of um, myth about what is true. And one of the myths that I experienced as true for a very long time was that it takes a very long time to, uh, firstly, to see what's true about myself. And then that it takes a longer time, perhaps, to come out of illusion completely, that it takes, um, it has to be a long, kind of drawn out painful process to, to begin to embody what I've seen to be true, to allow that to reflect as my life. So I really wanted to just spend a few moments talking about that and why it seems to be a difficult process, perhaps even more so than seeing what's true, it is experience is difficult to live as that. And over and over again, um, we may find ourselves going back into this old idea of ourselves of a separate, as a separate being, where our karmic patterns, our vasanas, whatever we're calling those, uh, begin to play and sometimes stronger, uh, more prominently once we've seen what is real about ourselves. And this is a process that everybody experiences universally throughout awakening, that the clearer I've seen what I am, even if that's just once so far or not at all. The more I'm interested in truth, what's true about myself, uh, in realizing experientially that I'm not a separate being, actually, that I'm not just this body mind, that I am something much greater than that. The more our karmic patterns are going to come into play, because the more they are no longer agreeable with what we're seeing about ourselves is true. And for most of us, for myself included, there can be experiences a very, very difficult time of swinging back and forth between um, a seeing, a clearer seeing or understanding or a realization of what I really am, that what I really am is not a thing at all, that I am formless and insubstantial and yet everywhere and all pervasive as that gets clearer and clearer each time I see it. And in swinging back or oscillating back to experiencing myself as a separate being, to falling back into illusion about myself or going back into some belief that's been very prevalent in my life um, and some negative emotion that usually comes along with that and some resulting experience so why why do we do that why does that actually happen why when we um have seen what we really are do we keep falling back asleep again because if we can come to understand why that's happening then we can take some measures to uh, minimize that and to be uh, vigilant to make sure that that's not occurring and really where we keep falling asleep again, dreaming ourselves to be a separate being, even after we've seen what's true. Um, if we first we can stop blaming ourselves for that, that to some extent it's going to occur, um, but we don't have to blame ourselves for, for it. And we don't have to um, use it as a reason to prove to ourselves that we're not good enough to wake up. In fact, it's our very interesting truth in what is true, that in some weird way is prolonging this dream, because if there are areas of my life that I fall back asleep into where I 
go back into feeling I'm not worthy of uh, awakening or I go back into some limited idea of myself that um, I'm never going to wake up or whatever it is that we are really hoping for in our life. Then why we actually fall asleep is because this area of our life, this belief, we're still feeling that that is true. So it's easy to say when I have a seeing that I'm not, I'm not unworthy. You know, I, I've never been. I can see in this real place, uh, the real self, that there's nothing inadequate about me at all. There is no awakening to really happen. I can see clearly this is what I am. And then I may at some point slip back into this idea that there is further for me to go, that I've got to continue to progress and try to wake up and come out of ego, our separate sense of self. So we fall asleep again in the areas where we still think what we're experiencing is true. So if I'm experiencing something that makes me feel unworthy, then to the extent that I feel a negative emotion around that is the extent that I really still feel that attitude about myself is true in this particular area. So we can have a seeing that we are not at all what we think we are, not the person we thought ourselves to be. And that can feel liberating and exciting and freeing. But then when it comes back to interacting with a certain being, or perhaps in a relationship or uh, around money, or um, in terms of even living as that self that we've seen, I can go back into automatically believing that I'm not good enough. I'm going to go back into allowing my experiences to tell me what's true about myself rather than relying on my own seeing. So if we're drifting back into illusion, into a painful sense of uh, separate self and experiencing, as I did for quite some time, this kind of swinging, swinging back and forth between what's true and what's not true, my old way of perceiving, and it can really serve us to recognize where I fall asleep is where I'm believing certain thoughts still. I'm only believing those thoughts because they feel true. And the moment I begin to challenge them, can this really be uh, true for me now after having seen what I actually am? Can this be real? for me now after and do I still want to choose to believe this thought automatically and in that moment when a sense of unworthiness or fear or shame or guilt or whatever it is that's playing it is happening in the body it may not be so clear that we are believing something but we can tell that we are by how we feel our emotions are going to indicate just how much we are convinced in this separate self at that moment. Just as when we have a seeing of what is real, the resulting peace and openness is showing us that we're not really believing anything about ourselves in that moment, that we are being that open, unknown um, space of awareness, let's call it today. So if we take a look at our lives and look at where we begin to experience suffering, where we habitually go back into old ideas and experiences where experiences are other beings, other things trigger us into feeling a certain way. We can begin to take an objective look at where we're still dreaming, where we're still going back into separation thinking. It's not true that this has to be a long drawn out process. If we can become just as interested in where we're still living from our old way of seeing ourselves as a separate being, as we are in what's really true about ourselves, then we need not suffer when these beliefs come up. If I'm open to see where I'm still living as a separate being, if I'm open to see where I go back into these old attitudes I've had about myself or other beings, then they won't catch me unaware. They won't be caught in them 
for very long at all. And um, I won't have to experience a large amount of suffering around it. So just as we're cultivating satsang, an attitude of openness to see what's real about ourselves, it really serves us also to cultivate this wanting to see what's not real about ourselves. Most of us, and I did it myself, uh, we cultivate this attitude and want to see what's real. And then we completely set about rejecting everything else of our old sense of being. But when some pattern is playing, if we can come to really look at what is this? Why am I suffering in this moment? If we can develop an attitude of inquiry and openness and wanting to actually see what is unreal, then immediately we'll come out of suffering. When pattern may still be running, there may still be thoughts happening, there still be emotion arising in the body, maybe even a sense of tension or contraction but we'll be able to just watch that play out without identifying with it, without falling asleep. There's no way to come out of believing something to be true, except questioning if it is actually true. So this must eventually go hand in hand with what we're seeing. I'm seeing clearer what's real about myself, that I'm not divided from anything, that I am, um, not separate or limited in any way that I've been looking at my body mind and identifying with and as them uh, and taking on their limitations as my own and at certain points in my life I'm still doing that to some degree uh, when the body feels fear I might be saying I'm scared you know when the mind is confused I may say that I'm confused So we can really begin to make much faster, easier progress at living as what we've seen if we're just as open to see what is unreal as what is real. Why don't we want to look at illusion? Why don't we want to look at the egoic sense of self? What is it that stops us from really developing this attitude? Why am I not perhaps as excited to see what's not true about myself as to see what is true. Now, when I stopped to really examine this in myself, I began to see it's only because I believe I have to suffer looking at what's unreal. I have to identify with it. The more and more I looked at it, the more I realized it's actually impossible to identify with these old beliefs if I really want to see where they're playing, if I'm really interested in looking at where I habitually go back into this old way of perceiving. And I found eventually that if I embrace where these patterns are still playing, even ahead of time, I can look at where I tend to go into contracted ways of thinking about myself then I'm much less likely to be able to just unconsciously fall asleep and begin to identify as a separate being again. And I might even begin to break through faster into what's real by looking at what's unreal, by not rejecting it. It's totally possible to have these karmic patterns playing and yet not identify with them at all if we're open to see where am I still deluding myself? Where am I still um, dreaming this dream of separation? Where am I still limiting myself artificially? Without blaming as well, that's the key. You as the real self have been dreaming yourself to be a separate being for a very long time. And that habit persists for a little while even after We've seen what is real, what is true about ourselves, even after we've come to sometimes a very clear seeing that this isn't real, that what I actually am is something much more expansive, then we can still find ourselves going back into these old ways. Why is that? Because we don't want to look 
we don't want to see. If what I actually am is awareness, that all awareness can do is to be aware. It's naturally uh, seeing in its essence, isn't it? Observing, witnessing, watching. And if there's some part of my life that I don't want to see, don't want to really look at, that I'm kind of unconsciously stepping back from, not wanting to see, then that's... Um, I am not being the truth in that moment. I'm not being the seeing. I'm trying to not see. We begin to suffer. And that is the only reason why these patterns continue. So if you find this helpful, uh, what I'm saying today, if you find this useful, you can literally take a pen and paper and make a list of the areas of your life that really aren't functioning so well. Um, maybe your awakening isn't functioning so well. And look at what ideas are being suggested in those moments to you by your mind out of habit that we've automatically agreed with. And a real shining of the true light that you are onto these illusionary beliefs is going to allow you to come out of them. Nobody wants to look at the egoic beliefs really we have to kind of cultivate a willingness to look but we only don't want to look because we believe it's going to be painful and we're going to get caught back in it again but what i'd really like you to hear is that we can only get caught in illusion again if we're not willing to see it playing the very moment i'm willing to see where i'm still being a separate being i'll be free of it I'll be awake to it. I'll be awake inside this dream that's still going on of a separation, of a separate being, the remnants of where that's still playing in my life. So looking at where your life isn't going so well and then looking at the ideas that play in those moments, seeing just how much some part of us is still invested in those ideas. And then just a simple willingness to see, to, to want to recognize and see. And we can cultivate that willingness in any moment. The only way I'm going to come out of this stuff permanently is to want to see it, to want to um, have this clearer and clearer recognition. This is simply not true for me anymore. And I don't want to keep experiencing it. So hopefully that leaves you feeling right back in control, that we're not um, duty bound to live out this painfully slow oscillation of um, experiencing what's real and then being thrown back into illusion, the un unreality of the separate self. That oscillation, that swinging will go on as long as I'm not wanting to see what's not real. As long as I'm only wanting to see what's real, it'll continue back and forth. So. Okay. So I've got um, two questions that have been emailed in here which I'll read out first um, and answer if anybody would like to ask a question or to share uh, anything about any challenges or um, any breakthroughs you're having in your awakening um, you can uh, feel free to raise your hand and just in case we've got one already I'll take up to another three questions as well for all together on here um, if you find the participants section on zoom which is a different place depending on what device you're using to access this. Um, and then click on the bottom of the participants section, there's an option to raise your hand and um, it'll let me know that you want to share or to ask. So I'll start with these two questions um, that have come in. First one says, <clears throat> 
Hi, Helen. I don't have to work presently because my husband makes enough money for me to stay home. <clears throat> and he's happy for me to do so. I have had a really hard time being able to work as well. I usually attract a really difficult boss or some kind of bully peer who pressures everyone not to talk to me. I've stopped looking for work since the pandemic. I've had insights about my problems being self-created. Uh, this was before discovering you and realizing that all problems are self-created due to an incessant need for consumerism. I feel stuck because I know I have some self-worth issues that have blocked me from abundance, but I feel guilty that I am supporting a system that seems to thrive on exploiting people. Can you help? Thank you. So as you um, come out of these self-worth issues, as you start to see in your awakening where um, you automatically go back into these ideas of unworthiness or a lack of self-acceptance and self-love as, as you've spoken about here, then you'll find that you'll naturally uh, draw to your different type of being. You won't have to keep living out this same experience that you've been describing here. Um, and also then these blocks to abundance will begin to, to lift. You'll see the abundance in an inner form first, the abundance of peace and well-being and a sense of uh, clarity. And <clears throat> Also, then if you begin to um, allow that to reflect in a, in a work environment, I would really suggest looking at why you want to work. You know, you've said here that um, currently financially you don't have to, but if you're feeling that urge to, to get back involved in that, then I suggest looking for the, the highest reason for that. And if it's if what you've been experiencing is this kind of consumerism um, that you don't like, perhaps you could get involved in some work to begin to allow something to change. Um, each one of us, as we wake up clearer and faster, has a, a, has a gift to give in whichever area we're going to allow that to come. So if you're going back into work with this belief system that you're supporting a corrupted system, you're going to get more of that. If instead you go back into this system, awake to what's real about yourself, then you're going to um, experience having an effect on everyone around you. Maybe that is ordinary, everyday awakened beings going out into the world structure. Maybe that's what's needed to kind of shift these systems that are functioning right now at the moment and to begin to experience life in a different way. I hope that um, you might find that you want to work because there's some joy that can come out of that from that place. I want to do it because I want to do it. You know, there's going to be a different outcome. It cannot be the same as it was before because you have shifted. So what you're going to experience is going to be a reflection of what you've seen to be true more than the old idea of, of what you've experienced in this area. So help that helps. Um, everything begins to change really as you wake up in that way. Okay, so this second question is, um, my question would be, is awakening a process that is imparted by an intelligence, presumably the noumenon or self, or is it what I would describe as purely mechanistic? What I mean is that when I look at the landscape of varied forms of awakening and enlightenment today, as well as in the past, I see a wide variety of cases from people whose awareness expands suddenly and without warning, when they didn't even ask for it in some cases, to others who have spent their entire life in meditation and prayer to reach the same state. And I can't figure out what the common thread is, if there is one, is. One is tempted to believe that there is an authority figure somewhere who decides when and where to turn the switch on. And boom, here comes a drastic change in awareness. Or 
no one is really in charge of the process because it takes care of itself like the rest of nature. In another recent satsang you gave that I was listening to yesterday, you provided a partial answer to my question. It's not always a big bang phenomenon, but rather a progressive change that manifests in feeling at peace and quietly happy. I've experienced a few of those recently and it's wonderful, but I would like it to be permanent and not just occasional. Or do the two types of awakening coexist and maybe more? Thank you so much for your work. You give hope to people like me who have been on the path their entire life without seemingly making much progress. So that's another good question. It was, for me, it was a very gradual process and um, there was very few big bang moments and mo mostly it was just a very um, gradual shifting of who I knew myself to be happening seemingly in the background at first, almost unnoticed. Um, and then it just began to really gather pace and momentum. What, what I want to say here is that it, it's both of these attitudes. It's, um, you've said, um, sometimes people experience these, uh, like almost as if there's some outside authority figure and suddenly there's this big boom and they have this shift, fundamental shift in who they know themselves to be. And sometimes people spend a, a, a lifetime in prayer and meditation. So is there something outside that's kind of giving us this moment of grace or something that, that facilitates this huge shift in, in our seeing? Or is it something happening inside through our inner opening and attitude and, and sort of our devotion to what's true and our persistence and consistence and determination? And I'd like to say that both of those are the same thing. The, the real self, there is only the one self and you are already that. And all that is happening is that you, the real self, are coming to see yourself clearer. And that is awakening in a nutshell. And to see where I'm not living as this, as I was saying before, in my life. Sometimes that seeing happens suddenly as you said sometimes it's very very gradual sometimes the sudden jumps punctuating a, a gradual uh, thing and everything in between those but the common thread in all of those is our openness to truth to see what's true and as i was saying before to see what's untrue because um usually in those times when there's a sudden awakening it's that we're suddenly tremendously open because what we feel is true what we've been experiencing is suddenly intolerable anymore suddenly um, unbearable and in that creates this sudden openness I had those moments myself where I just couldn't live with my uh, ideas anymore and there's a sudden openness or gradually practice through a practice through inquiry self-inquiry meditation contemplation an attitude of openness develops which is a habit. The reason uh, that openness is sporadic is because we keep going back to the old way. So what I've been talking about today, and really the best way I can answer this question is to, if you want that openness, that peace, that clarity to be permanent and stable, and most importantly, effortless, is to cultivate this attitude of questioning, questioning what's true, never coming to the end of that, never assuming that we've seen the end of what there is to see and also questioning what's untrue. Almost like I really won't believe anything anymore. I'm going to be in this open place where the answers are revealed to me from inside rather than trying to see. So it's really just a combination of both of these and that these are, um, that there's always this openness. Grace is constantly trying to work on us and grace is us. But it needs the body and mind's openness to, to be able to uh, permeate it. And that can happen in a second. Sometimes it seems to take us years to develop that openness. But as soon as it's there, there is a shift that has to be into what's fundamentally real. And that is what takes the time for all of us to kind of develop this openness this attitude 
So both types are the same one. If I, if you, if I were you, I'd spend some time looking at um, that both of these are the same, both of these modes that you're perceiving. What if they're the same one thing appearing two different ways? Okay, so we'll go to Shirley whenever you're ready. Hi, Helen. Thank you for your teaching Hi. today. I think you've partially answered my question, which is when I go to those areas of my life which might not be working so well and then I kind of open that Pandora's box, how much of me visiting that comes from the intellect and how much of it is just me being aware being aware of it and just resting in the awareness of those areas or the belief systems that are behind that and how much is my mind engaged in that, uncovering what the belief is or are. You, you probably find it's both for a while. You know, there's probably, let, let's say some pattern players in your life, uh, there might be greater awareness. This, this, here's this loop again, here's this pattern playing and something just able to watch it more clearly. Um, at the same time, there might be some trying to trying to change it, trying to think about it, trying to have a better outcome inside the pattern as well. Uh, and just being aware of um, both of those kind of ways of, of functioning, that I'm, I'm approaching this karmic pattern partly from my old way of dealing with it, which is just to kind of suffer my way through it, and partly from um, sort of just being able to watch it. And not trying to reject either of those, but just gently choosing. I'd like to really just see see this clearly. You know, if I'm not pushing against something, it's going to diminish. If I'm pushing against it, it's going to, you know, get. Well, I'm sure you've experienced what happens when you push against something. Um, but just just to want to see. Am I am I really seeing this clearly? You know, this curiosity. Like, am I really seeing this fully? You, you find very hard to, to identify with and start to think about the pattern when it's happening if you're really curious about it, really open to see. And that starts by not blaming yourself if you're still pushing somewhere against it. We're all pushing against something until we're not, especially when some something plays in our life where it just, oh, no, not you again, you know, not this thing again. The first instinct is always to push against it, isn't it? It's, Mm -hmm. if you kind of okay that that I don't need to go with that impulse to reject it and I can really sort of turn turn the habit into really looking into it when it happens like most of us and kind I, of want to run you, away right we want to run yeah. away so we just look into it just from awareness and just rest in that and just be with that allowing it to be there yeah but not not to see it as too I can I can want to be the awareness in this and, and in that may come some intelligent thinking from mind. What 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 really is this about? Why do I keep playing this out? You know, these kind of thoughts might happen that didn't happen before. You know, so mind can get involved in this in an intelligent way. Usually the thoughts that we have around a pattern are very limit, you know, very um repeat. Why is this going on again? Mm. Why is this not stopped yet? What am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. you know all of that yeah, yeah. Um, and it might be the exact same thought why why is this still happening but it's got a different energy to it why why is this still happening i really want to see mm -hmm. okay and so it, there's nothing wrong with thinking it, it, it just it helps to make sure that we're having some intelligent thought that's really going to help us come out of it rather than um an awareness may express itself that way but as a question like what is really going on here or what's sustaining this why, why is it still going around you know and it has a different feel to it that kind of thought doesn't it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like when you have an aha moment it, it feels in like a new original thought it feels refreshing it feels mm -hmm. you know and all thought can feel like that if, if we're coming from that openness okay thank you that makes a lot of sense thank you good question okay we did have another question um I think from Susan, if you do want to ask, hands disappeared, but if not, that is okay too. Hi, Helen. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Um, nice to meet you. And I'm 
thank you for taking my question. <laughs> I've just bought your book. In fact, I heard your interview on Backgap, so that's how I came across you. Uh -huh. um, I wonder if, um, if there's anything we can do about beliefs about the physical body. Yeah. Because I'm retired now, I'm getting older, and, and my mother has, um, is quite stooped, and I've I'm, my sister's going a bit that way. I'm kind of think. well, I definitely think, well, it's genetic. I'll do the yoga, do all the exercises, but what can I do about it? And it's deeply ingrained. And there's various other things which I think, oh, it's genetic. You know, my teeth, I've got, I always have problems with my teeth, loads of work on them. And then that's kind of so ingrained that I go into fear if, if I think, oh my God, I've got toothache, I'm gonna have to have some work done. And there's all kinds of panic things going on. I'm laughing not at you, but I mean, one, of, one of the greatest teachers on the spiritual pathway for me was the dentist, you know. I'd yeah. like to say it was some profound satsang, but it was the dentist, you know, absolute panic and terror every time. He was a really nice dentist, nothing wrong with him, but I, I know exactly what you mean there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very common. Um, if we can begin to see uh, that our body is not really a body, our body is arising out of awareness. It's um, a, a coalescing of our beliefs about ourselves. It's a physical representation of our real self, or it's the um, most densest um, vibrational essence of me. You know, you could say that you exist on many levels is infinite intangible awareness thoughts emotions and then a physical body you know all of which are kind of different vibration and the body reflects to us what we feel is true about us so if i uh, feel unworthy for example then something about my body happening is going to agree that i'm you know some illness or some condition um, will make me feel unworthy too. It's reflecting what's happening to my body is reflecting what I think is happening to me. So if I have this idea that I am doomed to kind of experience the same thing as my siblings, etc., you know, um, because I'm getting older and, and that's just something I can't do anything about, then I have to literally live that out as a reflection. The body is a reflection showing us what we feel, literally playing out what we feel to be untrue. If I feel unsafe, um, you know, insecure as a separate being, that's got to live out as things about my body making me feel unsafe. You know, some, some literally some reflection. So when something happens in the body, if you can look at how, what emotion comes with that and begin to turn it around, instead of saying this thing that's happening in my body makes me feel a certain way. You turn it around and say, I feel a certain way about myself and this is reflecting in this bodily issue. And then you can begin to actually get it in front of it. Um, otherwise we kind of just keep going around in the same cycle. You know, we have these beliefs about our body and um, if our karma plays out in a very physical way, karmic patterns, you just experience the exact same thing. So instead of looking, letting the experience that's happening in your body dictate how you think and feel, you can realize what's happening in your body is reflecting and won't really change until you examine how you think and feel. So you can kind of look at the ideas that come up. Um, for, for me with the dentist, it was I was terrified of him judging me, you know, for not looking after my teeth properly or the pain of having to have something done, you know, all kinds of stuff. And when I looked at it, it was a whole lot of unworthiness and all of that. And when I really started to investigate this, um, the dentist that I really didn't like left and his wife took his place and she's really, really lovely. Um, and, and I actually really enjoy going now, which is an amazing thing to be able to say. But it's easy we're all the illusion is that what's happening to my body it is unchangeable isn't it there's nothing i can do about it can you get a sense of it inside oh exactly yes i think i've got a lot of definite unworthy issues and shame 
I was brought up in the northwest of England, like yourself, and um, in the 1950s, a Catholic, <laughs> working class family. So, um, yeah, not a lot of uh, expectations, really. So, you, you, you learn to think of the body as a, as a mirror showing you, um, just like your finances can show you, just like your path to awakening, if, you, if your path to awakening isn't working so well, you know, if I can't seem to make this awakening work and it makes me feel unworthy then it's reflecting that I feel I'm not good enough if I can't seem to heal my body and it makes me feel not good enough I should be able to do this then it's reflecting that I don't feel good enough you just kind of turn it on its head the other way around the body's always showing us what we feel you know, whether it's it's feeling fear or some physical issue or whatever it is it's showing us what we're deeply subscribed to inside still about ourselves. that isn't true anymore Sometimes these things play even stronger as we start to really come out of illusion because they're less and less compatible with what we're seeing to be true about ourselves. Great. Lots of food, food for thought and investigation. Thank you. Lovely. Good, good. Nice to talk to you. Okay, we'll talk to Jay whenever you're ready. Hi. Um, can you hear Hi. me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the satsang. So um, question just popped up when you were discussing um, with Susan regarding the body and beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, so how, like um, liberated beings like say Ramana Maharshi and others, why, why do they, why does the body still manifest illness or afflictions uh, with people like that? Uh, it's a good question. Sometimes it's because um, some idea is still playing inside that being and hasn't been fully examined. Other times there may be um, some uh, um, karma taken on on behalf of another being that will manifest um you know sort of as a physical issue um when you're really open and able to kind of not believe any thought at all uh you might find that something is is taken on on behalf of another being to clear it for another being and that may manifest um physically if that's the way that our previous karma did manifest so so karma isn't um karmic patterns aren't just mine you know it's just the one being uh, everywhere experiencing itself as it, all these human beings uh, and in in that there's a whole um population of human beings that deeply feel unworthy unlovable and all of that and sometimes beings uh, the, the more they've seen clearer what they really are uh it, it's possible to take on karma for other beings let's say you're you know one area of your life it really isn't playing out well and you feel deeply unworthy about that and you find yourself around an awakened being sometimes they'll take on that unworthiness but it might come out physically if that's the way their karma played rather than financially you know so what we see is the appearance of uh, an illness or a disease is is really always um uh some belief playing that's not true but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, from that particular body mind you know so there's a couple of reasons why it might happen and eventually you know the body breaks down from something it has to come to an end through some mechanism so there'll be some kind of uh, illness eventually that's just the natural um, end point of the body's time the duration does that help her to, to kind of understand or? Yes, um, quite a lot. So then like for uh, mere mortals, <laughs> if as you um, deepen your awakening and abide in it more, is it more likely that physically you enjoy better health? Yeah, it's, it's much more likely that you'll begin to experience abundance in every way so that is more than enough of everything and that that can be uh, health vitality well-being peace 
money, um, time, compassion, you know, every, every single way that you could experience a lack as a human being, it's possible to experience uh, more than enough, which, which is my definition of abundance, not being able to run out of something. And that includes um, the health and well-being of the body. There are certain things that don't tend to heal, they'll stay for a lifetime, but we still don't have to suffer from those. Most of it though, um, I'd say 90 to 95% of issues will clear up spontaneously as you begin to really embody that awakening more because they're always a reflect, 95% of the time a reflection of um, some wrong idea we've had about ourselves or others that has really been so deeply believed that it's had to show up physically to really grab our attention. Um, we tend to ignore it when it's just thoughts and we tend to ignore it when it's emotion because we're, to a certain extent, we're used to feeling quite bad, aren't we, as human beings in, in a general way, um, you know, emotionally. Sometimes it'll have to show up physically to say, hey, uh, and, and that's the purpose of us having a physical incarnation is to be able to see that this stuff is playing and to go, oh, wow, I'm still believing that there. And then as I begin to really transcend that, it, it has, it doesn't have to keep shouting for my attention then. So these things tend to clear up more and more. Okay. Having so said that, they can sometimes flare up worse initially so that, you know, we, we have to look at them. Why? Did your teeth spontaneously improve? <laughs> um, yeah, in some ways, actually, uh, a lot of ways, yeah. Um, uh, but it never really was about that, actually. It was, um, you know, that, that was, it was a fear of being judged, you know, a terrified of, of uh, authority, as a lot of us are. And the dentist was um, the authority figure, you know, in that, in that way that my ego was terrified of. Even though I only saw this man for 10 minutes every six months, I was terrified of him. He's a really nice guy as well. He was actually, you know, it was, it was all in here. But yeah, it's, um, it, it manifested as a lack of uh, issues with my teeth. I got all those sorted out and worked through the inner beliefs. And now there's been very little to do with, to you know, to just the regular checkup, which I'm very happy to say. Okay, thank you. You're a very good question, lovely. Okay. So uh, we will leave it there for today. Thank you for all your very deeply intelligent questions and, and feedback. Thank you for joining me, namaste.